Turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5. As I'm going to be beginning a series on the sermons of Jesus. And how many of you like being blessed? How many of you like it when Jesus, when Jesus says you're blessed? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, it's a good thing. Uh, no, no, yeah, no one wants him to say you're cursed, right? No. Exactly. We all want him to say we're blessed. Well, Jesus talks about several people who are blessed. As we read his most famous sermon, this, in this, his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And we read at the beginning of chapter 5, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So, you can set the picture here. Jesus is, goes up this mountain... And he's speaking down to this huge crowd of people. Anyone know why he would go up the mountain to speak to them? Acoustics. Acoustics, yes, because there's so many people. He goes up the mountain so they can hear what he's saying. It's in the days before microphones. Before any of the nice uh, technological tricks we have today. And then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How often do you hear anyone saying, blessed is the poor in anything? Poor is not a status we think of as blessed, is it? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Humble. back to being humble again. Yes. Blessed are those who are humble. You are not the most important person in the room when you walk in, at least not in your mind. Your focus is on serving other people, being a blessing to other people. Jesus says, if you're, po Jesus says, if you're focused on ministering to other people, you're focused on serving other people. If you're humble, if you don't walk in thinking you're the most important person in the room, you're blessed. It says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Good thing to think of today. We want to be blessed of God. We all do. Are we humble? Everyone wants to talk about humility, but very few people realize what it really is. Humility is putting others ahead of yourself. Do you do that in your life? Or is it all about you? Jesus wants us to be the poor in spirit. He wants us to be the humble. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know when you're mourning, when you're going for a loss, a death in the family, a hardship. Do you know who is going to be right there with you during that time? Jesus. Jesus, yes. The Holy Spirit, yes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Jesus says, God is going to be with you when you go through that time of mourning. When you have the death of a loved one, a parent, a child, a brother, a sister. Jesus will help you through that. Jesus will comfort you. We read, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. What are the meek? I've often heard it called those that have power but don't fully exercise it. Right, they could do something to hurt somebody but they don't. Power, power under control. Yeah. <clears throat> they don't need to hit the room like a, you know, like a whirlwind. They don't have to announce their presence. They don't have to be the first one to talk. They don't have to be the one to stand out at everything. They don't always have to volunteer for everything and give no one else an opportunity. Sometimes people don't do that out of pride. They do that out of a lot of eagerness, but they're not thinking about, you don't need to stand out. You don't need to always be the one raising your hand. 
Let someone else do something. The meek don't announce their presence. They don't walk in and say, <laughs> Here I am! The meek are content to let their deeds do the talking. When they do talk, it's not about showing their great oratory skills. Meekness goes along with pride and humility. It very much goes along with that. But I think in essence, meekness is you're not trying to sell yourself. <coughs> you're not trying to put yourself out there. That goes counter to this world, doesn't it? Everything is about selling yourself. You need a job? You gotta sell yourself. You wanna keep it, you gotta prove it. So much of getting a job has nothing to do with your qualifications. It's how good you are at being a salesman for yourself. And it's amazing how many times these people who come into jobs with great interviews crash and burn because all they could do is sell themselves and they didn't know how to do the job. Yeah, I remember at a time when I was working on the night crew at uh, Van Til's when a guy came in and I was hearing talk throughout the company about what a great interview this guy had coming in. And some people were saying, this guy's going to be really good. He had such a good interview. They're so excited about having him come in and work. And he was the slowest stalker I'd ever seen in my life. Not just that, but he was the sloppiest too. In every single metric of doing his job, he was the worst. But he had a great interview. Well, my dad, my dad always, you can ask him today, my dad tells a story. This guy that came in and he had to interview him for Nipsco. Keep it short. And he said, uh, you know, he said all the right things, did all the right things, he was dressed to the T's, and my dad asked the final question. So why do you want to work at Nipsco? He goes, well, they go out and they sit in their trucks while they're supposed to be working. I think that'd be great. And, I, and my dad said, yep, that one, well, that one flew right out the window. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, the world talks about, the world doesn't want you to be meek. It's all about selling yourself. The meek person doesn't have to announce their presence. They don't have to show <coughs> how great they are. They just do what they have to do. And they're not looking for a pat on the back. They're not looking for praise. They just <coughs> do what they're supposed to do. That's a meek person. A meek person doesn't always have to be the loudest person in an argument. Because it's not about having their voice heard. A meek person is about serving God and... God will decide if they get the praise. God will decide if they get the glory. They don't need to show themselves. They let God worry about that. That's a meek person. Quality that is lacking sometimes. Are you meek? If you are, the Lord says you'll be blessed. It says the meek will inherit the earth. You know, one of these days, Jesus is going to come. He's going to create his millennial kingdom here on this earth. And you know who he's going to be putting in charge? <laughs> Earth people. It's not going to be the people who are the best at selling themselves. We're going to make. It's going to be the people that quietly do what God wants them to do. They don't make a fuss. They don't always have to be heard. They don't always have to have the last word. They just do what God wants them to do. <coughs> There's a power in that. And I'm more focused on what God thinks of me than what other people do. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. <clears throat> do we hunger and thirst after righteousness? Or do we just kind of like it? What does it mean to hunger and thirst after something? You want it. You have to have it. It's something you desire. You're not gonna. You're not gonna stop until you get it. You have to study. Right. Yeah. If you're starving, are you going to just casually ignore a piece of food? If you haven't eaten in days, 
Are, are you just... And you haven't eaten in days, and someone left a cracker out. You can grab that cracker before yeah. you back to work. <laughs> you're, you're not going to just look at it and say, eh, it's not my thing. Let's Even see. I, if I was starving, would eat an onion. I might hate the onion going down, but I'd need the <laughs> nourishment, so I'd eat it, and I wouldn't think twice about it. <laughs> because when you're starving, when you're hungry and thirsting desperately after something... It's not just a casual thing. Oh, I don't care. But reading God's word, yep, we not... should hunger for more and more all the time. Yeah. It's not something you do one time. It's something you you do regularly. Yeah, mm. daily. Yeah. So we talk about righteousness. Are there sins in our lives that we just kind of look at and say, that's eh, no big deal. Yeah, I got a problem with my mouth. I, I run my mouth too much. I swear and I shouldn't. And I gossip and I shouldn't. But it's no big deal. <laughs> If that's your thought process, you do not hunger and thirst after righteousness. Because it would be a big deal to you. Any area where you're not living a righteous life would bother you. And it should bother you. If we're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, then I don't even need someone to come and confront me because I'm going to be the most bothered person with my sin. And I'm going to want to do something about it. So ask yourself, do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Because they're the ones that shall be filled. I find that interesting. How many times do people want to be fed? They want to be filled. But it's the ones who hunger and thirst after righteousness that Jesus promises they will be the ones who are filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. How merciful are you today? What do you do if someone steals from you and then they walk <coughs> into church the next Sunday? Hmm. I've had to face that before. Well, not they walked into church the next Sunday, but... They stole from me, were unrepentant, and eventually walked into the same church I was in and acted like nothing had happened. That's a choice. I chose to show mercy. Because the Bible says the merciful are the ones who shall obtain mercy. That doesn't mean that I'm going to put myself out there and give that person a chance to steal from me again. But what it means is I'm not seeking revenge. I'm letting it go. I will still be kind to that person. I will still show the love of God to that person, even though that person has wronged me. And that's hard. That is the hardest thing, to show mercy when someone has wronged you. What is our first instinct as people? Get back out. Revenge. Mercy is also, someone offends you. You know, most of the time, you know, we all offend people, every one of us in this room. Most of the time, we don't even try to. We don't even intend to. Just a, simple, dumb mistakes. But we manage to get on someone's nerve. What do we do when someone offends us? You know what our tendency to do is? We'll give them a cold shoulder, or we'll snap back at them. That's not showing mercy, is it? Mercy is, I'm going to put that under the blood of Christ. I'm not going to let that offense be more important than the relationship. That's mercy. We don't have to get back at people for everything they do for us. We don't have to make an issue every time someone says something that we don't like. They might not have meant it. Or I'm going to tell you something else. There's sometimes people have said things that I didn't like, but you know what? I didn't like them because I needed to change my life. And sometimes by showing mercy and instead of snapping back at them, you might give yourself a time to think. Wait a minute. Maybe the reason that offended me isn't because they were trying to hurt me, but because they shined a light on some issues in my life that I need to fix. The Bible says the merciful are the ones who shall obtain mercy. If you want Jesus, if you want God to show you mercy in your life, be a person who shows mercy to others. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So what does that mean? I take my heart out of my body and put it through a rigid purification and cleaning process while machines keep me alive. And then put it back in and it's stamped 100% pure. They don't obey his laws. No hidden agenda. And yes, what you said is always right. Obey his laws. But what Matt said, I think, kind of summed it up. <clears throat> no hidden agenda. So... Would it be acceptable to God if I'm here pastoring in the church, but, you know, my real purpose is I'm hoping to impress the ladies while I'm preaching and, you know, and well, you are single. get my, yeah, and just <laughs> my preaching is a platform to me getting a wife. Is God going to bless me for that? No. No! He's not going to bless me. He will not bless me for that. Do people do that? Oh, yeah. Yes, they do do that. Just go to a certain college in the area, I know. People go to church for false mm. motives. People preach for false motives. People do everything for false motives. We're not supposed to do anything for false motives. If you're ministering, <laughs> minister to serve God. Let God take care of everything else. You're not supposed to have any other motives other than pleasing the Lord and loving the saints. It's not about getting fame and popularity. It's not about making money. Not that there's any money to be made here right now. <laughs> but that's not the purpose. It's amazing how many people, how many ministers I've known, will suddenly, they feel like they're called to preach somewhere, but if they don't get that extra $500, they're suddenly not called to preach anymore. <laughs> Well, how about trust God? He knows what you need. He'll take care of what you need. If you're really called to preach somewhere, God will take care of it. If you're really called to do a particular ministry, it doesn't matter if you're getting praise or a pat on the back. God will take care of you. Where are our motives? Why are we doing what we do? Don't let anyone steal your pride for Jesus. Well, what we read here is the pure in heart, they're the ones that are going to see God. What does that mean? They're going to see God. They're the one. If you're pure in heart, that's how you really understand the goodness and the mercies and the blessings of God. If all you're focused on is your own petty agendas, you're going to miss out on who Jesus is. You're going to miss out on his love for you. Not that he doesn't love you, but you won't be able to see it because you're going to be so blinded by your own petty agendas. And that's what happens when people are blinded by their agendas. Got a lot of single people. When someone goes to church with the purpose of getting a date, oftentimes that's the only thing they can see, is the purpose of getting a date. And what happens is that person, they can sit there, they can hear God's word, and it goes in one ear and out the other. Because they're looking for a date. I've seen it happen too many times. And as a minister, sometimes it makes me bang my head into the wall when I'm trying to talk to the same people. I wouldn't be quiet. We have to do the things of the Lord with a pure heart. Live your life with pure motives. And God will take care of the rest. God will give you what you need. You don't need to do <coughs> God's work for your own purpose. If you're doing something kind for someone, do it because you want to be kind to that person. If you're doing someone a favor, do it because you're really doing them a favor, not because, well, if I do Mike this favor, then maybe I can get Mike to uh, do this job I really don't want to do later on. That's not doing a favor with a pure heart. We need to have a pure heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. One thing no one likes to do is get in the middle of two people who are fighting. Get into the middle of two people who are arguing. Anyone enjoy that? Anyone? Anyone? No, I don't. Trust me. <laughs> Being in the midst of two arguing people and trying to bring them to peace sometimes is one of the most frustrating 
and difficult experiences you'll ever face. <clears throat> Being a peacemaker is often a thankless job, but it's an important job. How can we do anything for the cause of Christ if we're always in conflict? He's the Prince of Peace. He didn't bring us to be the people of constant conflict and battles and we don't like this person and we don't get along with this person and I think that person is talking about me and I really don't like that person's hair or glasses or whatever. We're supposed to be people of peace. The peacemaker is the person who steps in, they see a conflict and they try to lead people to doing it Jesus' way. Because the Bible has an answer for how we can have peace. Are you willing to lead people to that? Or do you say, it's not my concern. None of my business. I don't care if Andrew and Matt rip each other's heads off. It's, it's none of my business. <laughs> I'll sit there and watch. I'll videotape. No. no, no. Oftentimes what happens too often in the church is half the church it will be on Andrea's side and half the church will be on Matt's side no matter what the issue is. And then, there, then there's other people, they're just enjoying the fight and they're fanning the flames, talking about both parties. But what we need is people to be peacemakers. Try to bring reconciliation. Are we willing to do that? The Bible says those who are peacemakers, they shall be called the sons of God. That's what Jesus is saying. And women, no, that doesn't mean you'll be called the sons of God, you'll be called daughters of God. <laughs> Does that tell you how highly God views a peacemaker? Blessed are you if you're a peacemaker. Are we willing to try to make peace? Are we willing to try to bring people together? In the body of Christ, there shouldn't be any outstanding conflict. I mean, we're commanded to not let the sun go down upon our wrath, aren't we? If me and my mom are angry at each other, and then the next day she's not angry at me, but I'm still angry at her, guess who's in sin now? I am. It doesn't matter how good of an excuse I have. I don't fly with God. So what that says is, any feuds, any arguments, any disputes that are going on in the church, if they've been going on for longer than one day, guess what? They need to be resolved, because they're not pleasing to God in our lives, in the lives of everyone around us. Jesus wants us to be a peacemaker. And we read here, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, we live in a world where persecution of believers is becoming more and more common. Just read about a, a Christian school in Canada that the government there is going to shut down because they have a Bible verse on their wall. Government doesn't like their Bible verse. So if they won't take it down, the government's going to shut them down. Nowadays, you stand by God's word and the world insults you. They call you a hater. They call you a bigot, even though you've said nothing hateful or bigoted. Persecution of believers is on the rise. What does Jesus say if you do find persecution? <coughs> if you do get insulted by your boss for hanging, handing out tracts? What does Jesus say about that? Count all joy is what Paul said. Yeah, we read, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus values is you stood up, even though people might be insulted by it, even though people might not like it, even though people might attack you, you stood up and you shared God's word anyways. You served God anyways. That's what's important. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you in verse 2. 12, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How many of you, this is a rhetorical question, you don't need to raise your hands, but 
Have you ever been persecuted because you chose to stand for Jesus? That persecution can come from all kinds of places. Sometimes it comes from our own families. <laughs> Sometimes our own families can insult you because you stand for Jesus and you're different from them. <coughs> Sometimes it's at our jobs. It could be at a school. But Jesus says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So, For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you're persecuted for your faith, you're in good company. Jesus was persecuted. All of the prophets faced so much. Look at the apostles, what they suffered after Jesus died. You're in good company if you suffer for choosing to serve God. We read in verse 13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses, loses its flavor. How shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, put it, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We're supposed to be a salt of the earth. What does salt do to food? Seasons it. Seasons it. I'll give an example. If you ever tried no salt tomato sauce, I despise the taste of no salt tomato sauce. It's bitter. It just... I, I hate it. I despise it. But you mix some salt in there, and you know what? That sauce tastes a whole lot better. It just brings out a whole new flavor. All it takes is just a little bit of salt, and it totally changes the whole flavor of that tomato sauce. As Christians, we're supposed to be people that just by our presence, just by us being at an office, we can change that office. Just by us being around a group of people, we can be a blessing to those people, and we can change those people. <coughs> the problem comes if we as a salt lose our flavor. How do we lose our flavor? Sin. Yeah. Stay in the salt shaker. It'll definitely stop tasting. Yeah, what happens if the salt just stays there? Isn't used? Yeah. It goes bad eventually. <clears throat> We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to season this earth. We're supposed to change this earth. Are you the salt of the earth? Or are you sitting in the shaker still? Or maybe you're out there, but you've lost your flavor because you're not different <coughs> from the world. You're, you're no different. We're supposed to be the light of the world. As the light of the world, anyone should be able to look at you by your actions, by your testimony, and be able to know that you're a Christian. Your actions, your lifestyle, your testimony, the way you live should bring people to you asking you. Why are you different? <laughs> are we letting our light shine? Or have we covered our light up? <coughs> are we trying to be secret agent Christian? We're not supposed to be secret agents. We're supposed to be a peculiar people. We're supposed to be strange in the eyes of the world. Strange in a way that people are going to want to know, why are you so different? We're not supposed to fit in. We're not supposed to do everything they do. We're not supposed to say everything they say. Jesus tells us to let 
your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So as I close, I want to ask you some questions. Do you fit into the category of people that Jesus says are blessed? Do you fit in there? Do you see yourself there? <clears throat> if you don't, you need to do some soul searching. <clears throat> Nothing that's asked here is impossible. We ask God for things all day long. We all have so many needs. But Jesus tells us the kind of people he blesses. He spells it out in his word. Do we fit into this category? Are we poor in spirit? Are we humble? Are we suffering, mourning? That's not something we should hope to be in, but it's something we should take courage. So we should take encouragement from if we are in there because Jesus commands he'll, Jesus promises he'll be there <clears throat> are we weak do we hunger and thirst after righteousness are we merciful are we pure in heart are we peacemakers are we persecuted for righteousness sake and last but not least are we letting our light shine or are people shocked when they find out you're a Christian? And ultimately, it's not me you need to convince of that. I, I'm not God. I'm not the one who blesses people's lives. But can you stand before the Lord and say, Yeah, Lord, I'm doing what you want me to do. I'm living my life the way you want me to live it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd work on the hearts of everyone here. And I pray that we would want to line our lives up with what you want them to be, Lord. And it's no mystery how you want us to live our lives because you tell us how you want us to live them. You spell it out. It's not rocket science. It's simple. All we have to do is choose to obey, to stop being stubborn, to stop desiring our way over yours, to yield to you, Lord God. All these things you promise you will bless, you will bless the, us if we do these. These are conditional promises in your word. I pray that we would choose to take you at your word, <coughs> and we would choose to be what you want us to be, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to be that light that's shining so that people can be led to you, Lord, that our life, our works, that they would be a testimony. Not because we want people to look at us and think we're spiritual giants, no. What we want them is to see you in our actions. We want them to see that we serve a great God who has done so much for us, Lord. So, Lord, bless us as we leave here. Lord, help us not to be focused on ourselves. Help us to not be focused on the things of this world. To help us to be focused on you. You've done so much for us. You died for us. <coughs> on Calvary's cross, the most painful death imaginable. A criminal's death. And you did that for us, Lord. You've secured for us a home in heaven. <coughs> Lord, help us with all that you've done for us, Lord. Help us, as Romans 12.2 says, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, because that is our reasonable service to you, Lord. And help us to mold our lives to be what you want them to be, Lord. And if we struggle with that, Lord, help us to be humble enough to go to you and say, God, help me. I want to be who you want me to be, but I need help, Lord. 
Lord, work on our hearts. Help us to be humble. And help us to give our lives to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good job. Um, Brandon wanted your address, and he'll come over and look at... Well, you know our address. I, I forgot the numbers. It's right on the house.